thank, uh, I would like to thank the Institute for giving us this opportunity to introduce ourselves. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to meet you all in person soon. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll get right into it. I want to tell you about uh, very curious and uh, interesting situations where invariants from different contexts in math uh, end up being equivalent in a certain sense. So the contexts of math that I'll be thinking about are, are simple, but maybe different from what you, uh, you've usually thought about. So I'll, I'll discuss some dynamics, some algebra, and some geometry. Uh, from a dynamical point of view, I'm thinking about mapping classes of graphs. So these are going to be graphs, a graph gamma and a homotopy equivalence of gamma f, a self-homotopy equivalent. So I consider it a dynamical system because I can iterate it and ask things, uh, what changes when I iterate this homotopy equivalence. Uh, but I also want to think about this homotopy equivalence is up to uh, uh, conjugacy. And what that means is uh, F and F, a mapping class F and a mapping class F prime are going to be conjugate if there is some homotopy equivalence from the graph gamma to maybe gamma prime that conjugates F to F prime uh, up to homotopy. And uh, the way you should really think about this is the graph is like a choice of basis. And uh, when they're conjugate, then you're really looking at the same mapping class with different bases. So gamma and gamma prime are just different bases of the same, uh, but the maps themselves are the same uh, mapping class. All right, uh, that's dynamics. Uh, algebra, uh, I'm thinking about free, so-called free bicyclic groups. Uh, these are groups that fit in a short exact sequence where the quotient is Z and the kernel is a finitely generated free group. Uh, any group that fits into a short exact sequence like this will be called free bicyclic. And I'll consider them up to isomorphism and that's isomorphism of the group G. So the isomorphism doesn't have to preserve this splitting. And uh, finally, in the geometrical setting, I'm thinking about matrix spaces, like Cayley graphs with a combinatorial uh, matrix or universal covers where the deck transformation is acting by isometry. And uh, I, I want to consider this, is, I'm a geometric group theorist, so matrix spaces um, uh, are considered up to quasi isometry. And it's a bit of a technical uh, thing to define and the definition itself is not very enlightening. So I'll instead give you the idea. Uh, spaces are quasi isometric if they look the same from a distance. Uh, if you zoom out, squint your eyes, they look the same. Uh, a typical example is uh, integer lattice in this plane and the plane itself are quasi isometric because when you zoom out, the integer lattice ends up looking like a plane. Right, so these are the three settings and I'll be talking about now invariance, so dynamical invariance, algebraic invariance and geometric invariance. And in certain situations, those three things end up being equivalent to one another. So some examples of um, conjugacy uh, properties. If you give me a mapping class, I can say, uh, I can call it a toroidal. If it has no, uh, all these definitions are a bit hard to describe because they're negative uh, statements. If you have no periodic uh, homotopy classes of essential loops. So here's a picture of something you would not allow. If you have a graph and uh, three embedded loops that end up being permitted by your mapping class, then uh, that's not allowed. Uh, but the picture is a bit misleading because essential loops, uh, all I'm requiring is that they're not null homotopy, uh, but they can self intersect and they can overlap with one another. Uh, the picture here has them embedded, but they don't have to be. And uh, another uh, condition we might consider is whether it's irreducible. And again, you're irreducible if this doesn't happen. So your mapping class is ir irreducible. If it's not conjugate to a mapping class that has an invariant non-contractible proper subgraph. 
Uh, so uh, I have a picture here of a mapping plot and the blue subgraph is uh, being sent into itself. So it's invariant and uh, that's going to be a reducible mapping plot. We're not allowing that. So these uh, properties are conjugacy, uh, are invariant up to uh, under conjugacy because of like the second one already has conjugacy in its definition. And the first one has the statements about homotopy classes. Uh, so if F and G are conjugate, then F is going to be a toroidal if and only if C is a toroidal. And the same with irreducibility. Uh, but more interestingly, uh, a toroidal is a dynamical uh, invariant. And what I mean by that is if some power of F is conjugate to some power of G, then F is going to be a toroidal if and only if G is a toroidal. And the way to see that is that it, I already have iteration built into the definition of being a toroidal. Uh, so a toroidal becomes a dynamical invariant now because it, it's preserved under taking it iterates. Uh, but irreducibility is not. Uh, so there are uh, examples of irreducible mapping classes that have a reducible power. Uh, it might even have like a, a power that's homotopic to the identity. Uh, yeah, so being irreducible is not a dynamical invariant. Uh, surprisingly enough, uh, this was proven by Dottel, Kalkovitz, and Leininger, being etoroidal and irreducible is a dynamical invariant. So somehow, even though irreducibility on its own is not dynamical, uh, when you combine it with etoroidal, it does become uh, 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 dynamical. So now I'm interested in what happens when we switch settings. What if what happens if I move from uh, dynamics to algebra? Uh, so the way this shift happens is you give me a mapping class, then what I can do is I can cross the graph with the interval and then glue one end of the interval to the other using the mapping class. So I end up getting this uh, two dimensional um, complex and uh, it fibers over the circle where the fibers are copies of the graph gamma. And if you take fundamental groups, you, you get a short exact sequence uh, where your mapping torus fundamental group is a free bicyclic group. The question to Z and the uh, kernel is a free group, finitely generated free group. And uh, the interesting relation here is that if F and G are con uh, dynamically equivalent, so if some power of F is conjugate to some power of G, then uh, these fundamental groups of mapping tori are going to be uh, virtually isomorphic. They're going to have isomorphic finite index subgroups. And uh, to make the theory reach, uh, there are examples of F and G that are not dynamically equivalent, but still give you virtual isomorphic mapping tori. So uh, a virtual isomorphism is a strictly weaker uh, condition than uh, dynamical uh, equivalence. So naturally now you might ask, are there dynamical properties that are actually virtual invariants uh, that are preserved by this weaker assumption of having uh, virtual isomorphism? And uh, the first uh, example of this is going to come as an exercise. Uh, I'm, not, I'm going to do very little math, uh, but I, if you trust me on this, uh, you can show that if a mapping class is a toroidal, then uh, the mapping torus is going to have no z squared subgroups, and uh, vice versa. If the mapping torus has no z squared subgroups, this is the uh, yeah, if it has no z-squared subgroups, then uh, your mapping class was a toroidal. And what makes this interesting is because uh, having no z-squared subgroup is actually a virtual invariant of mapping tori. So uh, if uh, the mapping torus of F is virtually isomorphic to the mapping torus of G, then uh, uh, the mapping torus of F has no z-squared subgroup if and only if the other one doesn't either. Okay, so as a corollary, we get that being a toroidal, that was originally a dynamical property, is a virtual invariant. Uh, so once again, that means if the mapping tori are virtually isomorphic, then uh, both of them have to be a toroidal or both of them are not 
So we've now moved from being a dynamical invariant to a virtual invariant. A more interesting example is recent. Uh, I showed that uh, being a toroidal and irreducible is a virtual invariant. And to show that I, I, the virtual property that I detect this uh, dynamical property is having no infinite index free basic discovery. So it's a mouthful, and, uh, but uh, the idea is very similar to the exercise, except that it, it does become harder to show, for example, that all infinite index free basic link subgroups will have to come from either being toroidal or reducible. So that argument is a bit, uh, ended up needing a deep theory from uh, Spain and Handel in the 90s. Uh, but as a corollary, yeah, uh, being a toroidal and irreducible is a virtual invariant. So now we have two examples where a dynamical thing becomes a virtual invariant. And for the much more interesting uh, uh, situation is when, uh, when we move to geometry. So this slide is going to be like a 101 of geometric group theory. Uh, I'm going to give a very specific context, but uh, the ideas are really sort of like the un underlying uh, uh, theme of geometric group theory. So if you're trying to understand a group in geometric group theory, what you generally want it to do is to act <laughs> on a nice space. So for today, let's consider the space to be a connected graph. And our action is going to be uh, by simplicial automorphisms. And our restriction is going to be the action has a finite vertex stabilizers and a finite quotient. And one of the things you show in, in the first uh, course of geometric group theory is that under these assumptions, the group G is going to be finitely generated. Uh, but conversely, as well, if your group G is finitely generated, then the Cayley graph with respect to some finite generating set is going to satisfy this uh, assumption. So all I'm doing with this assumption is, uh, is equivalent to saying G is finitely generated. And uh, the really interesting thing is that the Cayley graph with respect to some finite generating set is going to be quasi isometric to this graph uh, X. And so it doesn't actually matter which finite generating set you choose. And once you fix G, it sort of doesn't matter which space X you choose. As long as you have this hypothesis, you're going to have the same quasi isometric class. So this is the fundamental theorem of geometric group theory. And it allows us to now think about uh, groups as geometric objects up to quasi isometry. And uh, one of the first, uh, one color corollary of this uh, fundamental theorem is if G and H are virtually isomorphic, finitely generated groups, then uh, G is quasi isometric to H. So uh, quasi isometry is weaker than virtual isomorphism. And uh, there are examples of groups that are not virtually isomorphic, but are still quasi isometric. So once again, this theory, this makes the theory rich because now we have quasi isometry as a strictly weaker assumption than uh, virtual isomorphism. And so uh, it makes sense to ask, are there virtual properties that are geometric invariant? And I, I don't know, the first time you see this, you should probably think no, because quasi isometry really doesn't, uh, say anything about the group structure at all. So it's just a statement about uh, uh, the metric on the group uh, on, your, on your space X. And even your quasi isometry is not really an isometry. It's a, it, it allows some linear distortion. So it doesn't map, have to map subgroups to subgroups or do anything like that. So uh, you, you sort of suspect the answer is no, but then surprisingly there are actually quite a few properties that are, were initially virtual, but turned out to be geometric invariant. So the first one is going to come uh, from this re uh, remarkable theorem of Brinkman uh, that says that a mapping torus has no z squared subgroup if and only if 
the universal cover of the topological mapping curve is delta hyperbolic. So delta hyperbolic uh, is a, a property that was introduced by Gromov in the 80s. And what that says is, if you look at your ma matrix space, then uh, any geodesic triangle, for any geodesic triangle, the delta neighborhood of two sides contains the third side. And uh, from a large scale, what that really says is all geodesic triangles sort of look like tripods. So it's a, it's a really strong uh, geometric property. It's invariant under quasi-isometries, uh, but perhaps the delta might have to change. So if you have X is quasi-isometric to Y and X is delta hyperbolic, then you can show that Y is delta prime hyperbolic. And uh, Gromov, when he introduced this uh, uh, space and the groups with this property, he showed that a delta hyperbolic group cannot have this squared subgroup. So this was in the mid 80s. And uh, the real content of Brinkman's theorem is that having no z squared subgroups implies your delta hyperbolic. And uh, even though the statement here, I've just put it as some algebraic thing is equivalent to some geometric thing, the proof actually goes through dynamics. So the proof, uh, Brinkman, what Brinkman does is prove F being a toroidal implies uh, delta hyperbolicity. And uh, the, the bulk of his work is understanding the dynamics of a toroidal mapping process. So to end uh, my talk today, I want to leave you with a conjecture. If I, I'll be bold and call it a conjecture, uh, that uh, being a toroidal and irreducible is a geometric invariant. So uh, uh, to be able to prove something like this, you would have to show uh, something analogous to Brinkman's theorem. Uh, that says that a mapping torus having no infinite index free by CP subgroup is equivalent to some geometric property. So uh, we know that it'll have to be delta hyperbolic because I have a toroidal here. Uh, but there has to be something else that detects irreducibility. And as far as I know right now, there's no, there's not even a candidate. So there's not nothing that I I can even guess to fit fit the bill here. So that's part of the thing I'll have to do. And once, once you've found something that fits the bill here, you will have to really understand the dynamics of a toroidal and reducible mapping classes to prove that uh, those mapping classes imply the universal cover has this. All right. Uh, and uh, I think that's what I want to work on uh, while I'm at the end. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. When you say uh, dynamics, you mean dynamics of iterating F like a pseudo Anosov, like a Thurston's theory, or some other kind of dynamics? Yeah, like uh, th uh, like Thurston's theory. So one thing you can do. There are lots of. Uh, I can sort of. I, I want to understand, for example, how if I take a loop and I start iterating it, how how fast does it grow? How fast does that homotopy class grow? Is that, uh, or, that, so my question is that theory sort of looks at one F at a time. While the questions of hyperbolicity sort of are global about the group, where are they married? If, I, if that makes sense. What? Your dynamics are to iterate one F, right? Yeah, I, I take one F and then I look at it. Uh, what happens at one end at a time. On the other hand, the big conjecture you had at the end was about hyper uh, grouping hyperbolic, which is uh, looking at all the, uh, the finitely generated group in total. So, is there a way of, or maybe that's a question for us to discuss privately? So, uh, like the thing I'm looking, uh, I'm taking this. You take one f, you form this mapping torus, and then you ask, is the universal cover delta hyperbolic? Uh, okay. 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 Thanks. Thank you, speaker.